Hello and welcome back to the Jump Show Cheltenham Festival Preview. I'm joined, of course, by Dan and Jake to look back at the festival clues from this weekend, answer some of your questions and give our anti-post bets for the festival. How are you doing, Dan? Very well, Nate. Thank you very much. As you say, more festival clues this week and realistically more festival bombs in terms of some of the markets. It's been a, a few shake-ups which we are going to get to and I think, again, we're going to start by talking about Supreme, as we seem to start every episode by. Uh, it seems almost <laughs> tradition at this stage. But yeah, very looking forward to it anyway. It's just such an ever-changing market. There seems to be a new runner in it every single week. Um, and how are you doing, Jake? How was your weekend? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Yeah, I think we're going to have to make a rule that next week we don't talk about the Supreme, no matter what happens. But <laughs> fingers yeah. crossed that we don't get any development. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's get stuck right into it. Um, we have a couple questions come in about Dysart Dynamo, and I guess that's the perfect place to start. And I'll head over to you, Jake. What was your take on Dysart Dynamo's performance? Yeah, I mean, it was a devastating performance, really, wasn't it? We we reacted straight away in the chat to it, and we were, you know, blown away just by how how good he was. Um, you know, his faultless performance. Willie's used the race many times before. He's used it for Valtor, Duvan, Min. So he's got all the credentials that will point towards him being a supreme horse, which if you're sat on a Ballymore bet slip at 25 to one or whatever, uh, I think you should be a bit worried really. Um, he recorded an RPR of 153. So that beats Constitution Hills um, 152 in the Tolworth the week before. Uh, so obviously that's a plus for him. Um, and if you go back through the Moscow Flyer runners, not even the winners, the runners that Willie has sent there, the last one he sent to the Ballymore was in 2009. And that was Mikhail Duhujnet. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's his name. And uh, he went on to win the Ballymore. But the thing is, the programme in Ireland was a bit different back then. So he'd already won the Lawler as a nace by the time he went to the Bosco Flyer. So he'd already run over 2 mile 4, which obviously Dice like Dynamo hasn't done. So as I said, um, I think 2 mile is looking like the likely option for him at the moment. Um, but something that we always have to bear in mind with Willie is that we won't know until decorations basically, if, if, if he's going to go to the Supreme or the Ballymore. It's very rare that he'll come out and say what the target is for a horse that could go for two races like this. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be it, what prices you got now. Well done if, you, if you're on a good one for, for the Supreme. Um, if not, waiting for the day and seeing what turns up. Mm. Dan, I'll head to you. Was this a bit of a freak performance or I did see a few people on Twitter saying that the field just wasn't very good. What was your take on it? I mean, on paper, it looked uh, a decent field. I don't think you'd call it a stellar lineup. I mean, it was filled with some very respectable rivals. I, I think if you were going to be critical, you'd say obviously Hawaii game was, well, he's obviously apparent second string, but looks good on his debut. He was just far too keen here and looked out of his comfort zone for a long way out. Gilly Billy was... Again, lethargic for most of it. He looks like a proper staying chaser down the line to me. I think he's very much a work in progress. And you had Gringo de Bro was the only other horse to really mount any kind of a, I wouldn't even call it a challenge. He never really got to within 10 lengths of, uh, of Dysart Dynamo, but he was the only one who really appeared to run his race. Obviously, I think he obviously finished behind Stage Star as well. So there are some form lines in there that would indicate what Dysart Dynamo did was still a very, very strong performance based on what other novices have achieved. I think the time would suggest it was just more of a relentless gallop rather than anything else. And I think you could tell by the way the field was strung out that he would just set such a fierce pace from the start and just maintained it throughout. It compared well to some of the other maiden hurdles on the cars as well. So it's, it's the type you'd have in a Supreme. I mean, you traditionally say you want a more of a galloping like type for that race rather than an electric turn of foot to miler. So you would definitely have that profile. But as Jake said, we, we, should really stop trying to second guess what Willie Mullins does with these horses. We we have no idea. I think Janadil was running over two miles exclusively. Then he went three miles for the Albert Bartlett a couple of seasons ago. So anything is possible with, with Willie. It really is. I think if you were going to hedge your bets, you'd probably say Supreme is more likely based on recent evidence. But given that the Ballymore is almost certainly going to be a weaker race, you'd probably bet decent money that one of those front four in the market will defer to the Ballymore. It's just trying to figure out which one it's going to be. Okay, that's it. No more Supreme talk until March. We are, we're, we're done with the race. <laughs> until March, we're laying it off for <laughs> two months. I like it. Um, I'm absolutely fed up to death of talking about John Bond Constitution Hill. I'm done with it now. 
Um, okay, I wanted to move on to the other big performance. There's a little bit more meat on the bones of this because we had obviously two horses end up near the finish, and that was Bob Ollinger. He did brush up his jump from, from Chase in debut, but I have to admit I was very worried when turning the bend, but he did level up and quicken away nicely. Am I being picky with saying I still don't think he's that good of a jumper? Have I just been spoiled from seeing like a natural jumper in Brave Man's game? And I'll head back to you, Dan. Well, I think you're definitely valid to say he's not the most natural, the most affluent jumper that you'll ever see. But considering that, as you say, the likes of Brave Man's game we've seen this season, who are just so natural over their obstacles, he definitely hasn't got that down just yet. By all accounts, they did a lot of schooling after his debut, and I think you could see some of the effects of that. I think maybe also having Rachel back on board was, again, maybe a bit of a help to him. It's definitely still a fair amount to work on there, but he's just got such an engine on him. It's almost, it doesn't really matter when he's tackling those kind of opposition. I mean, it was some good horses in that race, but he made them look fairly ordinary in the end. And to be fair, if you look back through the annals of history, some of the classiest horses and the most accomplished horses were never the best jumpers. Sometimes it's just pure natural talent that gets them through and is what really leads them to be the top class horses that they are. And it may well be a similar case with him. So it was uh, having a lot to like. Brushing was improved, uh, jumping was improved slightly, still plenty of work to do. I think it's just the way he finds another gear. Like it was almost in contempt how he did it as well. Obviously, Rachel had to stoke him along. I think he traded it just over even money in running about that point when Capadana was going well. But quickly he just kind of went through the gears he's held his head a bit high almost as if he was like i really having to work harder than i should just like almost like he, he shouldn't have to do this he's got that much talent but after a few kind of nervy moments he was two three lengths away and that was the race put to bed so he's a truly talented horse and it's going to be tough to beat him in wherever he goes presumably the turners at this stage but yeah, a lot to like, but still room for improvement, which is a scary, scary thing. I I wonder myself if Nichols watched that and thought of potentially pushing Brave Man's game towards that Turners. I could see him jumping a lot better than him and taking legs out of him every jump. Obviously, Nichols will fancy it. What was that? Sorry, he's that kind of guy. Nick Nichols will fancy it. He's that kind of yeah. trainer. We know he likes it. I mean, he will have no doubt that his horse jumps better mm. for sure. Um, if he's going to be able to overturn the difference that we've seen previously is another matter. But yeah, he, Nichols would not be afraid. No way. And uh, Jake, have you got any more to add on Bob Ollinger? You're really trying to make Nichols take Braven's game to the, the Turners, aren't you, Willow? Yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> well, I just want, I just want to see the matchup. Admittedly, I don't think he'll stay three, three miles up the hill myself. I think he'd be much better suited to two and a half this year anyway. Um, I've seen that RSA kill off so many horses, so I'd rather uh, I'd rather him stick to the Turners now and then be fresh and ready to go next year. Yeah, well, with Bob, Bob Ollinger, I did, to be honest, think that he might get beaten for a second, but like as Dan said, the turn of foot just to settle the race in a couple of strides, like what he did in the Ballymore last year, really, just completely kill off the race in, in the matter of strides. It was pretty damn impressive. Um, he recorded an RPR of 165, which again is a really good rating for, for this time of year. Um, there was a bit of confusion after the race where the Press Association put out that he might go to the Dublin Racing Festival next. Uh, in the racing TV interview, Henry Jerome had kind of said that he probably won't. Um, but imagine the clash between him and Gallopin de Champs if they both did turn up at the Dublin Racing Festival. That would just be such a, a, a lovely race to, to watch, wouldn't it? And be so informative. Um, probably won't happen, but we can always dream of these things. Um, but I think also a shout out has to go to Capodano. Um, he ran a really nice race in second. Um, as I said, you know, he traveled into the race probably better. Um, he didn't have that turn of foot, but he still ran on really well. Uh, they've got a bit of a, a conundrum of where to place him, I think, because he's rated 147 over hurdles in Ireland, which is quite high. Um, and, you know, from what he's achieved over fences so far, you'd probably say he's improved on that which means you're just talking about 150 in Ireland and then adding on the British tax as well. I think you can't really go for a handicap with him because it'd be too high. And then if you're, if you're talking about races to step him up to, um, the National Hunt Chase has been quite well touted for him. Again, I'd, three miles, six furlong, I don't know if that would stretch him. That race obviously was over two and a half. Um, so that's something else to consider. Um, but he's definitely one to keep an eye on and see you know, what, what connections decide to do with him. I'm assuming they'll have to give him another run. If you know, if they want to qualify him for that national hunt chase, they need to run over three miles um, and place it in the race. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see on that one. 
but he ran a really nice race in second. Yeah, that, that was that was on my notes to ask the pair of you where you would send Capadano. Obviously, as you say, handicaps are likely too high for him. Obviously, Bob Wallen just got the better of him here. You could only think going up the hill would be even better. And then he'd have to bump into Gallup and Deschamps if you went to the RSA. So he looked in a really horrible place. Uh, Dan, would you have any idea where you would send Capadano? Oh, I know we're on a Cheltenham show, but Cheltenham isn't necessarily the be on end or I think there are going to be suitable targets for him for this season and for seasons beyond, which you can probably avoid both Bob and Gallup and Deschamps once placed correctly. Look, there's no way he goes for a handicap. Firstly, it's not Willie Mullins' style whatsoever to do that. He's going to be off a stupidly high mark and Willie, I don't think he's ever won a handicap chase at Cheltenham. To correct me if, I, if I'm wrong there, but it's just not in his wheelhouse to do so. I think he's probably more of a three miler. I think some of his best forms over his, in his hurdle season came over three miles. I think that's where his long-term future will lie. And, he, and he's going to be a very nice horse for the next couple of seasons. There's absolutely no shame in, in how he performed here against Bob Ollinger. I think time will probably tell it was a very decent run and there will be days in him, but whether it's going to be at Cheltenham this season, I, I would have my doubts. But for the next couple of years, he's definitely one who will pick up his fair share of races. Okay. Let's, let's move on to some questions. This is the perfect time to say if you have any Cheltenham-based questions, then please drop them in the comments down below. Or alternatively, drop us a uh, tweet on Twitter. You'll find our socials in the description below. The first is a tweet that's come through from at Mika underscore DJ. Um, and he says, is Adagio a good each way bet for the champion hurdle at 33 to 1? And I'll go to you, Dan. I've put up West Court for the county, so I'm obliged to be somewhat positive on Adagio, given he was uh, <laughs> he was somewhat close to him uh, in the Great Wood. It's a tough race, and I think these races where we have such dominant favourites are very tricky for anti-post punters. I think we'd all be of the opinion that it, you're pretty much just playing for two places at this stage, which obviously diminishes a lot of the appeal of the bet. He's a consistent type. We know he was a, a very good juvenile. He seems to have taken that form into open company and he's a very uncomplicated type, it would seem, which would hold him, hold him in good stead for a tilt at a race like this. But, I mean, he has plenty to find on figures still. I mean, and there are some decent rivals in opposition who will be playing for that place money too. And you've got the likes of Sharjah, who you know is going to run his race. Epitant's been there and done it. I mean, you wouldn't have her out of the shake-up necessarily for those place money. You've got to appreciate it. Some are not so sleepy. All horses have achieved more at this stage. And I know we're not talking about these as rivals for Honeysuckle, but we're almost thinking there's probably going to be seven, eight, nine maybe chances of filling, filling in the places. So, look, it's not the worst bet in the world. I just think it's a very awkward spot at this time where you're just pretty much betting purely for place money. And I don't think it's a race at is going to cut up drastically at this stage, which might make it worth taking. So it's a tough one. Not the worst bit in the world, but not something I'm lining up to have a go on anyway. And Jake, have you got any more to add on Adagio? Maybe you're a bit more confident. Yeah, I mean, his performance in the international, uh, in, not in the international, sorry, in the Great Wood was monstrous. You know, to run as a four-year-old off a mark of 147 and go that close was a brilliant effort. It's something we don't really see very often. Um, I think the problem is, as Dan mentioned, is you, you, you're already betting for two places because if you like Honeysuckle for me is one of the bankers of the festival. She probably is the most likely winner of, of any of the races. So for me, it's not really something that I'd be looking at because you bet, as Dan said, there's only two places left after that. You've got Sharjah, who looks as solid as ever for a place this season. Um, the unknown of appreciate it. If he turns up, then, you know, he's going to have a shout. Um, Epiton, as, as Dan said, and then Zana here is you've been running really well this season. Tiupo, the same, also been running really well this season. So I think there's a lot of Irish horses, especially that are going to be, you know, going for this race and trying to fill these places in a race that we kind of think we know the winner already. Um, he missed the international hurdle due to a setback as well, which is another thing you've got to consider. He's entered in the Betfair hurdle where if he does run, then again, he would have to lump top weight, uh, depending on what marks the Irish get tomorrow. Um, so, you, you know, assuming that he would need that run, he could run an absolute stinker there and then be drifting out even further in the betting. So um, I don't like to bet anyone off a 33 to one shot. But for me, I don't think he's a bet at the moment. OK, we'll move on to the next question, which came in from uh, Mitchell Letizia. And that is, why does no one want to win the champion hurdle anymore? I put a little tweet out with a whole <laughs> list of horses who I think could go novice chasing next year. And everyone went, well, why do none of these 
go over the champion, go to the champion hurdle. Um, so we did speak about Adagio obviously potentially being a place chance at the champion hurdle this year. Official ratings aren't everything, of course, but he is rated 152, which is not the standard we'd expect for a championship race. Um, he obviously has time on his side and he can improve, but you, you look back at it and Epitomp won a poor champion hurdle. You, people crab over Dare's achievements um, for a lack of quality in the race. Why is this a race that's just been so poor in recent years, Jake? Well, it, it all stems down to really that horses are sourced from the Irish point to point field now. All the good ones come from there, don't they? Every year, we see it year in, year out. The best ones come from there. They make a ton of money. And they're all bred to be free male chasers, gold cup types. So the problem you've got is you're starting a horse, especially in bumpers, when, you've, when you're starting one, one of these horses off in bumpers, then they're going to be four or five when they, when they start their bumper campaign. Normally, sometimes they're six, um, which that means you're five or six for novice hurdles, you, you're then six or seven for your champ champion hurdle season. And then assuming that you're bred to be good chasing and you want to be going for like gold cups in time, you're going to be end up being eight or nine by the time you get to open open chase you know, companies. So that's a bit old, isn't it? If, if you're a nine-year-old going into your first Gold Cup, then it's not exactly ideal. Um, you've got like the likes of Appreciate It, who was a six-year-old when he, when, when he was second in the champion bumper. So Gerhard was six-year-old when he won the champion bumper last season. So I think that's another contribution um, to that. And then again, like you'd know more about this, Willie, than I would, but the good flat horses are just being sold to Hong Kong, Australia, et cetera. And we're not seeing the likes of, of, of a, you know, of a flat horse going to have a champion hurdle season anymore. Um, unless the owners have got a real interest in the jumps then they're not really bothered about it and you know they can sell them on and make more money so um yeah there's a number of different factors that are you know outside of of, of just racing and you know to do a breeding and, and and selling as well but um yeah i just really hope that one of john bond constitution hill dice like dynamo so go hard you know one of these horses surely next season could be a proper champion hurdle contender i know we might have appreciate it this year um remains to be seen if he makes it back from injury but we just need that one horse to challenge Honeysuckle and just to make it a race that we're excited for. Because right now it's one of the, you know, one of the least exciting races of, of at this stage of the festival. Mm. The, the, the flat comment obviously sparked my interest. Um, and and the, 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 <laughs> Have huge, a day off, like. the, the huge issue with that would be the amount of horses just going over to Dubai this time of year and something like, even like Cheltenham can't compete with the prize money. So why would they risk them over a hurdle when they could go and win a race over in Bahrain and win more money for even a, a lower graded race? And, um, and Dan, have you got any more to add on that to uh, topic? Well, no, I have three points labelled out, three reasons why it's not necessarily people don't want to win it. It's just a, a lack of horses for it. And, and Jake now all three. I see abundance of stammers in pedigrees these days. Speed is definitely being bred out of horses for the most part. I see they all tend to be point to pointers. That was point number one I had. The other point was about obviously age. You get so many different various campaigns. They go on by the time they add a open season over hurdles. These horses are going to be nine pushing 10 sometimes going into open company over fences and that's not what they really want to have happen. And yeah, less smart horses off the flat as well. So it's a, it's a combination of all th three things, really. It, get, it comes back to long-term planning for the BHA, race planning, prize money. There's are so many factors you could delve into as to the underlying causes. It's far beyond the scope of this podcast and far beyond the scope of my remit to discuss how to solve these issues. <laughs> but if we can see they're there, then surely everyone else can see they're there and they need, need to be addressed and... God willing, they will be sooner rather than later. Okay, before we get into our selections, we have one more question, and this comes from a mixed bag of tips. How often can you actually beat the Betfair SP when betting anti post on festival handicaps? You can nearly always get a decent price on the day. Dan, I think this question is tailor made for you, someone who <laughs> seems to beat the SP in these big handicaps on uh, for the festival. Let us know your thoughts. <sighs> Well, I, I can I sort of understand what he means, but at the same time, I think if you look down the races and the markets at the minute, especially the way they're now being priced, especially all the open races and all the conditions races, I think you could argue a solid case for there being more value in handicaps at this stage in the RAV for the conditions races. I mean, you've still got more unknown factors, which is a big, big thing when it comes to pricing things up, which generally means the more detailed research you can do as a punter and the more study that you would you a greater edge. On the bookies and i know we like to think the bookies are all seeing all knowing and the what the price is is what the price should be but i think with handicaps where there are so many potential runners 
like if you've got a decent angle and you know kind of who's going to go where and what events might be up proceeding up to the, these races, there's definitely value and an edge to be gained there. So I, I did a quick look back at some of my handicap bets for the uh, for Cheltenham last that I made around this time last year. Uh, just a few that actually ended up going there. Others didn't and got no one no bets. So it was fine, but. I mean, the boss's Oscar was 25 to 1 for the Potemps. I think back in November at a FRSP of 4.5. I Wright was 25s for the Ultimate, FRSP of 7.4. Rivier de Tell was 22s, FRSP of 9.6. Jones de Mead 12s, the FRSP was at half that. So there's definitely room to be had there. And you've also got to remember, Bet FRSP, you're generally backing win only there. Whereas there are still reasonable each way place, places to be had there. And bookies are generally doing five places as well uh, from an anti-post stage. So the terms aren't the worst. And it's not like you bet into three places either. So I, I think there's still value out there in handicaps. So I think if anything, as I say, there's probably more scope for discussion at anti-post price on handicaps than there are the Grady braces. And uh, Jake was speaking beforehand about how last year may have been a bit of an anomaly uh, price-wise for the Betfair SP. So what were your thoughts on the question? Yeah, I mean, so as Dan mentioned, like if you could, if you know where a horse is going to run at this stage, then you can definitely beat the SP and you can you know definitely make some money through that. Um, but yeah, last season's festival, we unusually really, we had 28 to 1 winner, 80 to 1 winner, 33 to 1 winner, 14 to 1 winner, 12 to 1 winner, and a 33 to one winner of, of the handicap. So they're just like the biggest price. I've left the ones that are a bit smaller. But the year before, the biggest price of a handicap winner was 10 to 1. Um, they were all shorter than uh, they were all shorter than 10 to 1 other than one race. So like if, if you're going to be backing those horses on the day, then obviously the bet for SP is going to be quite small compared to obviously if you if you backed um the eight to one winner, I've forgotten his name now, uh, of the Boodles. But if you backed him on the day, then obviously the, the bet for SP is gonna be massive. Jeff um, so Jeff Kidder, sorry, yeah, that was the one. Uh, so yeah, so uh, yeah, it's just a thing of I think this season we might end up reverting back to shorter price winners of handicapped again to more of the you know the, the types like the bosses Oscar where you know down on the angle in November people started backing it all the way through the winter qualify for the race and then you know he he went off you know, a very short price. I think you, you'll get a lot more of that this season just because there's not gonna there's gonna be these social runners that are back. There's going to be people that can go travel over from Ireland now and watch their horse again. Um, you've got all these factors of, of not crowds not being there that are no longer there. So, like, you know, I think this season we will get a, a bit more of a, a punter friendly, should we say, uh, return, uh, you know, a, a set of SPs for the handicaps. Um, but, yeah, it, it's always about knowing um, what trainers' plans are, you know, if, if they're going to be going to Cheltenham. If, if you know which race they're going to be running in, sometimes, you know, they'll have like entries between the Coral Cup, the Temps and the Martin Pipe or something. If you know which one they're going in, then you're going to, you surely will beat the SP. Um, it's definitely, you know, a, a big question and one that we could spend hours on answering. Um, but yeah, there's, I think there's definitely value at this stage. It's all about profiles as well. Like if you're back in horses that have been around for years and the running handicaps like day in day out they, they're in known quantities of course you'll get a bigger price on the day because they're not the kind of attractive profiles that punters are going to look for come off day like as, you, as jake mentioned so many big prices like the vintage clouds uh, what do you win at 33 to 1 in the ultima like no one was back him anti-post yeah. like because it was probably that anti-post because well it was like an 11 year old with about 25 starts over fences those aren't the types you back about the novices, the unexposed second season chasers, like those are the types that will shorten drastically. So it's just about being selective. Okay. Yeah. Time to move on to uh, selections for week three. And I'll shoot straight back for you, Jake. You can lead us in this week. Yeah. So I have gone for the ultimate handicap chase this week. Um, I know Dan has already put fantastic ass, and I really do like the shout for that. Uh, I think it was a great case, and I think he, you know, if he if he turns up for the race, then I'd probably be putting him up closer to the time or you know on the day type thing. Um, but the one that I'm going for anti post wise is Corach Rambler uh, for Lucinda Russell. So this eight year old uh, ran in the Classic Chase this weekend, and he only came fourth. So you might be thinking, oh, you know, what's going on here? But if I just go through the case, I think you can actually see uh, that there's quite a good face for him. Uh, so he started his season um, at Perth back in September. So he's had a good amount of runs now, which is which is a bonus. Um, and he ran behind Malella Trump, who's a 140 horse, and Pay the Piper 143 horse uh, um, over two mile four furlong. So that's a bit of an inadequate trip for him. Um, but he ran on well for third that day. 
was a promising start. He then stepped straight up to three mile one furlong Aintree in October, and he won off a mark of 127 in a novice handicap chase. Uh, he beat Sail Away that day, who's a 135 horse for Skeletons, and he gave Dusart a good race at Leicester the other day to, to give the form a little bit of a boost. Um, on his next start, he went to Cheltenham, and this is like the crucial bit. He's, had, he's now got Cheltenham form. Uh, so he ran over three mile, one and a half furlong on the new course there in a uh, novice handicap chase. He was off a mark of 134 that day. He traveled through the race really strongly, got to the front probably a bit too soon. Uh, Derek Fox said after the race that he thought he got there too soon, but he stayed on up the hill really nicely. One by two lengths beat Eva's Oscar, who's a 140 horse. Uh, so that was a, a good effort. Um, and that, that race has actually produced um, some Cheltenham types in the past. So two years ago, Imperial Aura uh, finished second in the race. Uh, he went on to win the Novice Handicap Chase, obviously, and Happy Go Lucky won the race last year, and he finished second in the Ultima shortly afterwards. Uh, so it's a good little trial. Uh, but yeah, so Corich Rambler, as I said, ran on the weekend in the Classic Chase. That was over three mile five furlong. Um, he looked like he was going to fall out the back of the TV down the, the down the back straight, really. Uh, but he picked up again, like to, to, to get fourth at the third last. Uh, he only really stayed on the one pace after that. I don't know if he necessarily stayed the trip or maybe in combination with the ground. Uh, he didn't really see it out as well as he could. Um, but he actually ran a really similar race to the Conditional, who won who won the Ultima two years ago. Uh, the Conditional was stuffed 22 lengths in the race in fourth uh, for mark of 142. Um, and then he dropped down to 139 before winning the Ultima. So Corrich Rambler also ran off 142, also finished fourth, and was beating 19 lengths in the race. So they do have similar profiles. Um, but the best thing is Lucinda Russell has since said, we'll dream to get to Aintree within one day, but this season we'll probably go to the Cheltenham, to Cheltenham for the Ultima. Uh, so you know it's the target. He's going to be dropped in the handicap. We'll find out on Tuesday how many pounds. Uh, if he gets down to 139 or below, um, I'll be very happy. Uh, he won off 134 in December, it's worth remembering. So if he's only like five pounds higher, I think he's got a really good chance. Um, and you can get about 25 to 1 for him uh, for the Ultima. So I think that's a good price at this stage. Okay, someone's tackling your selection, Dan. What was your t- how do you reckon Corak Rumble will get on? No, he's he's been on the the short list. I tend to form as well for this race as well. I think Jake made a lot of valid points. He's got a very good profile for the race. Like, no disgrace in his run last time out. It's a very funny race. I mean, obviously Claire Surf dominated it from the front. Nothing really got into it from behind, so I wouldn't really read too much into him being beaten, whatever distance it was. But no, yeah, I can definitely see the case. And as well, for transparency's sake as well, Jay, I think it's probably best we do mention it. Obviously, we did now receive a bit more information on Fantastic Ass. So he's not necessarily going to go in the Ultima. They might well be looking at the Scottish National as a long-term target. Personally, with that news, like if I might well cash out my bet on him and maybe look to play him when there's non runner no bet available because I still think my arguments are valid for his profile being fantastic for the race but given he's probably only going to drop probably to like 25s with non runner no bet I may well cash out my 33s and place a bit of a safer wager but I think for transparency's sake and for advice sake I think that would be what I'm going to do okay and uh, if you want to go and shoot your selection as well yeah sure so I'm a bit annoyed about this one actually because I sp- I spotted him a few weeks ago at 25 to one and there was a lot of good signs there. I didn't take my own kind of credence and he's now into 16 to one, but I still think 16 to one is a fair price. And that's going to be Vorban for the triumph hurdle. Now it was a very smart performer in the flat over in France. He won a listed race over a mile and a half. And he was subject to some very, very kind words in the build up to this season, especially by his, the racing manager for the Richies, Joe Chambers who said in one of the prominent horse to follow lists that we haven't been ex- excited about a horse we've brought off the flat since Saudi A. Now, obviously, Saudi A kind of has a, mi- a mixed bag reputation, but ultimately he's a very classy individual. And for him to be compared or to be live up to that billing, suggests they have hold him in very, very high regard. And he was duly very well backed on his hurdle and yard debut. It was almost as if victory was certain. I think he went off a four to nine shot. He was about even money when he opened up. But to be honest, I don't think his supporters that day probably would have ever really been happy with the way he was going. His jumping wasn't very fluent. Paul Townend kept switching right and left, almost trying to get a bit of an angle at his hurdles. It was a very, very strange run and ride. But to his credit, he kept on very, very well with Pied Piper, who was a much more professional performer, was fairly fit from the flat, only ran about two or three months ago prior to his hurling debut and is in his own right a very, very smart horse by all accounts. Now, the front two that day pulled an absolute mile clear. 
Now, Vorban was the first to come under any kind of serious pressure, which isn't surprising given how he jumped, but he kept on really, really nicely. He closed all the way until the last, and then he made another error at the last. That literally cost him two lengths. Then he rallied again and got to within half a length. So given all the setbacks he had, I think that was a, a monumental effort on his debut. Now, those two pulled 15 lengths clear of a horse called HMS Seahorse, who's rated 83 on the flat, and then came out today, as Monday as we're recording this, and ran a really nice race to finish second in the competitive juvenile hurdle. Uh, Brazil was fourth, Vera Virtua was fifth, and those horses finished seven lengths and three lengths behind Ikara Allen, who is currently 10 to 1 for the triumph. So based on that form alone, it puts Vorban's debut in quite a positive light there, and from a rating perspective as well, it was quite highly regarded. Back in fourth in Vorban's race was Max Mayhem. He was 25 lengths behind him, and he'd actually previously finished the exact same distance, effectively, behind Phil Dore. So again, these kind of you're starting to get these form lines stacking up with Vorban's, which indicate he's probably a decent horse. And then Graham North, who does a lot of the time figure work for Sporting Life and Timeform, he commented, commented on the race, noting that the closing race sectional from two out was over two and a half seconds faster than any other hurdles race on the card, which again would suggest the way they those two carted clear, that they're both decent animals. And I think Darva Star was on that same card as well. So it's not like comparing it against naught to 100 handicappers. Like you, a 150 horse in Darva Star was admittedly running over two and a half miles, but it shows that it was a fair old standard. Now, at, at present, I think I do prefer Vorban to Pied Piper. Just I think the former has a bit more scope for improvement, given how much he did wrong. And Pied Piper Bowl accounts was quite stiff post-race and isn't a certainty to necessarily race again in the near future. And I think a stiff two miles around Cheltenham, where there's only two hurdles in the final seven furlongs, would probably be the absolute ideal scenario for Vorban. Now, by all accounts, he's going to go to the Spring Juvenile Hurdle at the Racing Festival. He's currently three to one second favourite for that. Phil Dore's the favourite. I'm not sure Phil Dore will go there, given that he's already had plenty of experience. And we've seen previously that Gordon doesn't necessarily like running his absolute best at that race with concerns over the ground. So if he doesn't go, Vorban's going to be a fairly short order to win there. And if he does, I think it's only a matter of time before he becomes single figures for the triumph. And, and the state of the triumph market in general, it, it's beyond Phil Dore. It's a bit of a mess, really. You've got In This World, who was highly touted, impressive debut, it's worked out well. But by all accounts, he's had a bit of a setback. And if you look at the exchanges, there's no real faith that he's getting there. I think the other day he spiked massively at 30. I think he's back into about 16s on the exchanges, but that wouldn't fill you with confidence. You've got the likes of Porticello and Knight Salute, who are respected, but I don't think they're top class. Ichio for Paul Nichols is a, again, impressive debut, but way too keen. And Nichols wasn't exactly saying he'd go to the Triumph based on previous experience he's had with some of his other smart juveniles. You can see why he'd dodge it. So it's an open race, I think, outside of Fildor, who is solid, but not unbeatable. So at 16 to 1, I think Vorban is a decent bet, and I think he'll improve massively for that debut. And I can see him being a big player uh, come March. Did I hear that right? That um, Pied Piper might not run against a juvenile, or did I mishear you say that? Sorry. No, he's, he was apparently very sore post race, and they were a bit unsure about where he might go next or how quickly they were to turn him out again. He's entered at the Dublin Racing Festival. He might well run there, but. Apparently, it was, uh, yeah, wasn't exactly in great condition after the race. So what that means exactly, I'm not sure. OK, and my selection this week is going to come from the Stairs Hurdle. Now, I wasn't planning on sticking up, a horse, uh, sticking up this horse this early on, but I was listening to a podcast and one of the main takeaways I took from their Stairs Hurdle chat was the fragility of Classical Dream. I think that Punchestown race um, at Christmas is the key piece of form. And with that in mind, the selection is going to be Flooring Porter. Now, he has had his quirks. Um, he normally gets worked up at the start of races and races freely throughout. But he did look more polished uh, than ever when chasing Classical Dream home at Punchestown. And I'm hoping it's a coming of age moment for him. I will go back to what I said earlier about Classical Dream. He's been pulled out twice in the last two seasons on account of just being lame. He was also off the track for 400 plus days. So you have to be wary of backing him anti-post. I'd have Floor and Porter and Champs sort of the other way around in the betting anyway. So I think he is just a touch too big. Now, even if Classical Dream was to turn up here, given that start at Punchestown and potentially a change of tactics, which I believe you spoke about, Jake, with Classical Dream potentially getting held up, I actually think that could play into Floor and Porter's favour. So around six to one, I'll happily go straight win bet on him. OK, so that's going to about wrap up week three. Four selections from Dan, three selections from me and Jake. 
Anyone else got anything to say at all? Are you two going to catch up anytime soon, or am I just going to have one more and look be the outlier in this little you can little be, trio we've got? You can be the outlier. I thought it was rude actually that you'd stick up an extra selection. <laughs> you are. I've got plenty, and I delivered. <laughs> <laughs> I've got plenty in the pipeline, but I'm just waiting for the right time. I think that's often, uh, you know, something that's underlooked in Nantes betting. You've got you've got to know when to go either before a race or after it. So I'm just waiting to see uh, how things develop before now now on the festival really but uh yeah we'll catch up at some point i did a harry skeleton and went too soon <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah tip to 33 to one shot non-runner we love to see it um... <laughs> that doesn't count you're catching it out <laughs> because we're gonna happen <laughs> well one sec let me let me put up a caveat when it comes non run no bet and i'll back it at 25 so then then we'll all be square uh, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can just replay the clip of the first episode no. stick that right in no one will know <laughs> i'll wear the same clothes to make it look seamless <laughs> all right lovely stuff we'll uh as always please feel free to like and comment send us your chapman questions and also give us all a follow on twitter as well and we'll see you next week for another chapman anti-post video